good job. Very good job. Let's turn to the book of Luke, chapter number 7. Luke, chapter number 7. And we are thankful for Corey and his using the talents for the Lord, and then Camille using her talents for the Lord as well. And uh, they did a, a great job. I'd kind of be in trouble if I congratulated you, Corey, and didn't say anything about Camille. So <laughs> you, 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 did, you did great. So thank you for. Thank you for doing that for us. Luke chapter number 7, uh, we're going to begin reading there verse number 11, and we'll read down through verse 17. So Luke chapter 7, beginning there in verse 11, uh, reading through verse 17. Luke here records about the life and ministry of Jesus. It says, soon afterward, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples in a great crowd went with him, and as he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out. The only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still, and, 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 and he said, Young man, I say to you, arise, and the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother, and fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great spread through the whole of Judea and all of the surrounding country. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you uh, for this uh, precious privilege of coming to your house to worship uh, the one true God, Lord, to be able to celebrate, uh, Father, the goodness and the grace of God in our lives, to be able to sing, uh, as we sang earlier in that song, Christ is Mine Forevermore, that we know that our pain will not be wasted because you are ours forevermore. And God, we just ask that as we look at this passage of Scripture together today, that your Spirit would guide and direct our hearts, our minds and Lord, that as we think through the implications of what is revealed to us here in this passage, God, that you would just drive within us a, a deep sense of, of uh, understanding of the compassion, uh, Lord, of the Messiah upon our lives, and Lord, to know beyond any doubt uh, that if there's one we can turn to that truly does care for us, that it is your Son, Jesus Christ. And God, may you help us today to be guided by your spirit, may help us to give you the honor, the glory, and the praise that is due your name. For it's in your son's precious and holy name we pray, amen. There are two fundamental questions about God that I believe that most people, if not all people, uh, will be confronted with at some point in their lives. The first question is the most basic, and that is, does God exist? Uh, many people think about this question and they come to a, uh, a conclusion uh, for whatever reason that God does not exist and they for some reason aren't able to grasp the revelation of scripture along with the natural revelation that we have around us but for those of us uh, and I believe that we've come to this conclusion or at least are leaning towards this way to conclude that yes God does exist uh, the second question follows that up by asking what is God like? What is his nature? What is his character? Uh, how does he interact with us? We know that he exists. Uh, we know that everything we see could not be without a, uh, uh, an intelligent design uh, that, that he has set in motion the things that we experience. But it doesn't really tell us a whole lot about his thoughts toward us. It doesn't really tell us a whole lot about his thoughts towards uh, the, the world at large. So we rely on the revelation of Scripture uh, to help us understand a little bit about what God is like. We believe uh, that God has revealed to us all that we need to know about Him in His Word, uh, that it clearly defines and lays out His character and His nature. And we're in Luke chapter number 7, where I, where I believe we can answer in part this question, what is God like? By looking at what His Son Jesus was like. And so as we find ourselves here in Luke chapter number 7, we see in this passage, particularly uh, in this chapter, that Jesus is performing miracles uh, for an audience, if you will, not as a performance, but as a teaching mechanism. Uh, by allowing the disciples, the followers, the crowds that were with him to get a glimpse of 
what he was truly like, what he desired to do, and what his mission and motive was for being here on this earth. In the first example that Jesus gives or, uh, uh, through Luke's writing here is the healing of the centurion's servant and the great faith in which he had and Jesus' willingness to respond to faith. Uh, aren't you thankful this morning that Jesus does respond to our faith? Uh, that when we, by faith, trust in him, he has guaranteed us that we will be saved and it won't be a, uh, okay, have faith and then if you're lucky, he will respond to that. No, he does respond to our faith. But we also see here with this widow that Jesus reveals himself to be a compassionate Messiah. He reveals himself to be a compassionate Messiah. After the interaction with the centurion servant, Luke says that soon after this, that he went, and again, he's not necessarily writing in chronological order, but he is giving us a collection of thoughts in order to lay out a good groundwork to know that what we have heard about God is real and is, and is true. So he, he leaves that event, and sometime after that, he's on his way to the place called Nain. Now we ask ourselves, why was he going to Nain? Uh, and to be honest, there's no other explanation than he knew that there was a funeral procession that he intended to disrupt. The Bible tells us here that as he came upon this funeral procession, that he saw the lady, he had some interactions with her and with her dead son, and then the crowd left and all. And I hope this morning that as we see what Jesus is teaching his disciples here, that we'll be reminded that Jesus demonstrates compassion toward our human condition. And we'll also see, secondly, that he demonstrates his power to do something about it. And I hope this morning that we will leave, as the crowd did with all uh, of the Messiah, all that he cares for us so passionately. I want to show you the first thing, and that is that Luke describes here, and I believe we can see about this Messiah, is that he's a compassionate Messiah. As you think about this story, and Jesus has come into this place where there's a, a funeral procession happening, we know that this lady is a widow, as Luke clearly describes. Uh, we don't know how uh, uh, much time had passed uh, from when her husband had passed away to this moment, but now her son is dead. And it's interesting that Luke describes it as her only son. And if you look that up and, and chase that down, it is the same terminology uh, that John would use about Jesus in John 3.16, that he, God gave his only begotten son. And we have reason to believe that this was probably her only child. Now, in our day and age, wouldn't that be difficult uh, to, to be a widow who has lost her husband uh, but now also to be burying her only son, but also her only child. But we could multiply that difficulties, um, and I don't know exactly how much you want to multiply that, but I was trying to think of a good way to put that, and I was like, no, somebody's going to argue with that, whether it's tens or thousands, I don't know, but it doesn't matter. You can multiply that difficulty by thinking about the context that she was in. In, in those days, it was not easy for a lady to be able to get work that was of good repute to earn a living to provide for her own needs. It was not easy for her to interact in the business that would needed to be taken care of just to survive life. And it was not possible in a lot of respects for her to provide protection for herself. And so this lady has lost her husband who would have filled that role and now she has lost her son who would have filled that role in his father's stead. You can understand that this lady was in bad shape. More than likely, this was the very day that her son had passed away, as the Jews often buried on the same day. You can understand a little bit about the condition that she was in and the sadness that she was experiencing. But I want you to think about what Jesus did and what he said in verse number 13. Look there so that I can show this to you. Verse 13. It says, and when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. Again, no other reason I know of that Jesus even headed to name that day other than to interact with this lady. And the Bible says that he had compassion upon her. 
That, that word compassion literally means to be moved inwardly, to have pity upon, to, to feel some sense of sadness and grief uh, over the condition that she was in. Now, I remind you, Jesus knew exactly what was about to happen. He knew that her son was going to be resurrected. He knew that she was not going to have to live in this grief for too much longer. But yet the Bible says that he still had compassion towards her. He showed pity on her. He was sad and grieved in his own heart because of the grief and the pain and the sadness, the worry, the anxiety, and the fear that she was currently experiencing. And I believe what we see here is as Jesus is revealing to his followers that day that our Messiah is a compassionate God. He is a God that looks upon our human condition, our human sorrows, our human weaknesses, our human sadnesses, and it moves him to pity. He's not an angry dictator in heaven that is just sitting there waiting for the first opportunity to smack us upside the head and tell us to get our act together. He is not some God that is removed from the day-to-day -day stresses of life that does not know does not care, does not interact with the pain and the sadness and the heartache and the difficulties that you and I go through. And I believe this is proved throughout Scripture, not just here in Luke chapter number 7. And so we're going to run down quickly what the Bible has to say about our God being a compassionate God. So if you want to write these down, if you're good at Bible sword drill, you can try to follow along with me, but I know I talk kind of fast and uh, so, I, so I may not be able to do that. It's kind of interesting to have a good southern accent, but yet a fast southern accent, right? I think that's an oxymoron, but that's, that's what happens when I preach. Think about what we read earlier in Exodus chapter number 34. Again, Moses asked the question, God, would you help us to know you? God, would you help me to understand who you are? What did God say in response? Well, that's what we find in verses 6 and 7. In chapter 34, he said, The Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord. The Lord put anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving in iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of our fathers and on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And we oftentimes place our emphasis on that God is a God that will not allow people to get away with evil. That he will not, as that passage said, clear the guilty or will not avoid visiting the iniquity. And we just completely look over the part that it says that he is a merciful and gracious God, slow to anger. Probably the verse I've quoted the most since I've been your pastor is the book of Psalm 103. And I'm going to quote it again because it's good, okay? And it fits here, and I love it. And obviously you haven't gotten it yet, so I'm going to keep giving it to you, right? You should be able to quote it by now. Psalm 103, listen to what verses 18, 8 through 14 says. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. Listen to this part. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us for our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love to those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us? As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. This is my favorite part. For he knows our frame. He remembers we are dust. You know what the psalmist says there is that God chooses not to remember our sin, and yet he chooses to remember what he made us out of. He chooses not to remember all the dumb things we've done, but yet he chooses to remember the weakness of our human flesh. But Jesus was moved with compassion several times. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, we read this. 
And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, for they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. In the book of Matthew, chapter 14, verse 14, it says this about his compassion. And when he went ashore and he saw the great crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. In the next, in, in their sick. In the next chapter, chapter 15, it says this. Then Jesus called uh, on his disciples and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I'm unwilling to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. Matthew, chapter 20, verse 34. And Jesus, in pity touched their eyes, and immediately they received uh, their sight. Mark chapter 1, verse 41, And Jesus moved with pity, stretched out his hand, and touched uh, him and said to him, I will be clean. In John 11, verse 35, uh, the shortest verse in all the scripture, Jesus wept. Why did Jesus weep? Was it because Lazarus was dead to be no more? No. He knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He wept because of the sadness, the sorrow, and the grief from Martha and Mary and all of Lazarus' friends and family. You see, I believe the Bible paints a very clear picture to us that God is a God that is compassionate towards our human frailness and weakness. And if you can't or haven't gotten anything out of the book of Luke, over these last 21 sermons that we have preached from this book, I want to encourage you to grasp this reality that we serve a God that is understanding of our weaknesses. We serve a God that is compassionate towards our struggles. We serve a God that is moved with pity when he sees our sorrow and our grief, even when he knows that our sorrow and our grief is not going to last forever. Are you listening this morning? We serve a God that is compassionate towards us even when our struggles over things that are temporary, that do not matter and of no importance. When it matters to us, it matters to God. And I think you and I oftentimes struggle within our own understanding of Scripture and what the Bible teaches us and maybe what we have heard that may not even be actually biblical is that God is not understanding when you and I struggle with sin. That God is, is somehow just up in heaven saying, man, I can't believe they went down this road again. I can't believe they did the same old thing that has caused them trouble over and over again. And here we are again. They're asking, them, uh, they're asking me for forgiveness over something they know they ought not to do. But that's not the God that is painted in Scripture. He remembers we are dust. He, he knows our frame. He knows what we're made of. Don't think for a minute that... Uh, as you're sitting beside the deathbed of someone that you love dearly and that you have beseeched God over and over and over again to heal them of their sickness, to deliver them from this sure death that is headed their way and God does not heal them, don't think for a minute that his heart is not grieving in sadness with you as you are grieving in sadness over the loss of your loved one, that he somehow, because he did not answer your prayer, simply does not care about the struggles that you and your loved one are facing. Don't think that God is unsympathetic towards the fact that our world for the last year and a half has been turned upside down by something that you and I had no control over and is going to change our lives uh, probably for the foreseeable future. Don't think that God has fallen asleep when you're up all night unable to sleep, worry over the future, and that God has just gone to sleep not there with you. That is simply not true. Don't think that you serve a God that is not waiting there with open arms to receive you back into his loving care when you realize your sin and are ready to come back to him and think that he's just not going to care. The best way that I can illustrate this this morning is to understand the relationship we might have when somebody experiences something that that we experience the parent-child relationship is often shown in scripture about our relationship with God and so as a parent you can think about that if your child is picked on in school and you were picked on in school that you have a special reaction to that Reality, because you understand the pain and the heartache of that. If your child struggles to grasp a concept in school, and obviously the English language is that for me. I uh, misspoke early on a word, and I'm still thinking about that. Uh, but Brother Gary's going to tell me I shouldn't be thinking about that. Just move on from it. Brother Gary, I'm going to move on, okay? I'm not going to think about that misspoke, misspoken word. 
when your child uh, has has a struggle grasping that, it's a little bit easier to be patient with them when you understand that. But when you grasp it well, you're more tempted to think they just need to pay better attention. They need to try a little harder. They need to put a little more effort forward. Maybe you don't have children. You can think about the time that you tripped in a store and made a public spectacle of yourself. And then you see somebody else do the same thing. It's a lot easier to have a little bit of compassion towards that, right? Than to walk away laughing. But if you're the one walking away laughing, you're going to be the one that needs some compassion the next time, right? That's how this works. You say, Brother Daniel, Jesus doesn't understand the struggle I have with sin. Well, that's not true. The Bible says that he came to this earth and he was tempted in every point just like you and I are. Jesus doesn't understand the grief I've experienced. That's not true. Think about the loss of those that were dear to him, a light Lazarus, and the grief that he experienced over that. Uh, God doesn't understand what it feels like to be rejected. His own people rejected him. God doesn't understand the frustration that I feel over the circumstances of life. That's not true. Jesus came to this earth so that he could experience every single aspect of our human weaknesses. And he is not a God that cannot relate with exactly what you're going through and exactly what you're feeling. That's how God feels about us in our human condition that he's willing to reach down and to touch us with his love and his care. I trust this morning that you and I will be convinced that we serve a compassionate God towards our human condition. But the second thing I want to show you this morning is that Jesus here demonstrates his power to fix her human condition. He demonstrates the power to fix her human condition. Let's think back through this story, and I want to highlight a couple of things that might be of important note as we think about the power that Jesus demonstrates here. First of all, you can think about the fact that this lady was obviously loved and cared for. The Bible says here that this was a considerable crowd. It wasn't just one or two. It wasn't just a a few select friends and family that uh, that, that, uh, were were there out of duty, uh, knowing that they'll be talked about or thought bad of if they don't show up to the funeral. No, this is a crowd that has been overwhelmed by the grief and sharing in the realities that this lady is going to face. More than likely, uh, there would have been professional mourners there that were, uh, were paid literally to come and help express the grief that she was feeling. A great crowd of people. And can you imagine the absurdity if one of those professional mourners who were paid to come and cry and wail looked at the lady and said, hey, you need to stop crying. You need to just be okay. I hope that sounds absurd to you because it sounds absurd to me. Does it sound absurd to you? Are you awake this morning? Please check your neighbor's pulse and make sure it's still beating, okay? I really don't want to perform CPR this morning. And I'm not going to. I'm going to defer to anybody and everybody else who knows CPR before I put my training to use, right? All right. Anybody want to volunteer to go first? One of the professional mourners would have looked at her and said, Hey, quit crying. I know your son's dead, but there's nothing you can do about it. Just move on. Wouldn't that be absurd? Absolutely it would be absurd. Absolutely we'd be frustrated over that lack of sympathy, that lack of empathy that they showed. And the great crowd of people that were there with her, that were feeling her pain, that were experiencing her remorse, that were dedicating themselves to walking with her through this moment, could do absolutely nothing to fix her problem. And yet, this man Jesus, who never introduces himself, this man Jesus, who nobody says, Hey, Jesus, you're God, why don't you do something to fix this problem? Jesus walks over to this lady and he says exactly what I just said. Do not weep. Essentially, he's saying, quit crying. Stop your mourning. Stop your grief. The Bible says that he reached over and touched the beer. And the beer is a kind of a a, uh, open casket, if you will. We still use them to this day. We uh, that's what we refer to the thing that has the wheels on it that the casket is sitting on top of. 
he touches it to stop the procession. He doesn't pull over like he's supposed to and wait for everything to go by. He reaches out his hand and stops. And that very act, according to the Jews, would have made Jesus ceremonially unclean. By touching the transportation of a dead man, yet Jesus threw out those ceremonial rules and showed us that people are in ministry are more valuable than these rules. And then he talks to the dead man like the dead man's not dead. Because he's not. His body is dead, but we believe the spirit is eternal. That life is eternal. Even for those who do not believe and says, hey dude, get up. And then hands him over to his mother. Didn't call him on to be a missionary to Antioch or anything of that. He said, hey, go back and fulfill your duty to your mother. And Jesus that day demonstrated his power to deal with her problem. Can I tell you this morning that the only thing that is going to do anything about our human condition is the Lord Jesus Christ. The only one who can reach down and fix the problems that you and I experience that he demonstrates compassion towards is God. Would you turn with me quickly to the book of Romans chapter number 5. I want to show you something here as we turn there. And I want, I want it to be clear that a part of the human condition is exactly what this lady was experiencing in death. Part of the human condition is suffering and trials and heartache and sin. Listen to what Paul wrote in the book of Romans chapter 5 verse 12. He says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. So death is a result of sin. So death spread to all men because all have sinned. So the man was laying there that day because of sin and, and his own sin. For sin indeed was in the world. Before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. And verse 15 says, But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by that grace of that one man Jesus Christ abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one's man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because one's man, one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through one man, Jesus Christ. Now hit the rewind button to verse 6. Paul would write this before writing about that death that passed to all of us. For while we were still weak, or your may, translations may say, for while we were still sinners, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for for us, since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have now received reconciliation. Can I tell you this morning that it would not be very comforting to know that Jesus was compassionate and understanding toward our weakness and yet he left our weakness, he left our sorrow, he left our pain unaddressed. Do you follow what I'm saying? What good did it tell the weeping lady to quit crying as her son lay dead on a casket carrying him and not be willing to raise him from the dead and what good would it be for us to understand that God is compassionate towards us without doing exactly what is necessary to deal with what we need compassion for our sin nature needed the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ to pay the penalty of our sin to give us eternal life 
We need the promise of God that whoever believes in Him will receive eternal life. That to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That when we die as a believer, we are with Christ. Accomplished through the death of His own Son, Jesus Christ. Understanding the loneliness that we feel, we can look to the promise that He will never leave us nor forsake us because we understand that through His death and our faith and our trust in Him, He has given us the power to believe and to trust in that promise. To understand that we have the power and the ability, as Philippians 4.13 says, to do all things through Christ which strengthens me. To understand the book of Romans chapter number 8, that all things work together for good in the conforming us to the image of his son. I believe the majority of people listening to me this morning will agree that our God is a compassionate God. Would agree that Jesus is the only one able to fix the problem of our human condition. But can I ask you this morning, do you live like it? Can I ask you this morning, do you walk through life with that constant faith? If so, I believe we'd be able to listen to the book of 1 Peter where we are told to cast all of our cares on Him because He cares for you. Can I give you a modern translation of that? Thank you, I believe I will. The word care and the word care in that passage means the exact same thing. You know what I said? It means the exact same thing. So Peter invites us to cast our anxiety, to cast our worry, to cast our concern, to cast our thoughts on the person of Jesus Christ because he is anxious, he is worried, he is thinking, he is caring about you. Why do we need to worry when God is already worried enough for us? That may sound blasphemous, but we can go study and I can show you it's true. And if we were living like it was true, maybe we could be obedient to Philippians 4, where Paul tells us to be anxious, to be worried about nothing, but in everything through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your anxieties, let your worries be known to God. Can I tell you this morning, we serve a God that is compassionate towards our human condition, and we serve a God that is powerful enough to fix our human condition, but is also faithful enough to do exactly that as we've asked him to do. There's an old hymn that reminds us of this truth, entitled, No One Ever Cared for Me Like Jesus. It was written in the year 1932 by a man uh, by the name of Charles Weigel, who was impressed to write this song based off of his own life experience. He'd answered the call to preach at a young age, very talented in music, and became an uh, itinerant evangelist preacher, traveling all over the world preaching the gospel. And he came home one day to a note from his wife that said she was going to be leaving him and taking her only son with them. She said she'd had enough of the life of being an evangelist's wife and wanted to chase the bright lights. Those were her words. That sent Mr. Weagle into a deep depression. I mean, he lost everything. Lost his wife, lost his son, lost his ministry. Went through years of depression, contemplated suicide because he thought no one cared for him. But he did not. His faith was restored and went on to write these words. I'm going to read the verse, uh, course first and then we'll read the verses to you. Writing these words based off of the experience of thinking nobody cared. He said, no one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. The verses he would write says this, I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus. Since I found in him a friend so strong and true, I would tell you how he changed my life completely. He did something no other friend could do. All my life was full of sin when Jesus found me. All my heart was full of misery and woe. 
Jesus placed his strong arms about me and he led me in the way I ought to go. Every day he comes to me with new assurance. More and more I understand his word of love, but I'll never know just why he came to save me till someday I see his blessed face above. I'll read the course again. It says, no one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me.